Right, Bill, I'm going to make a start. I think we've got quite a lot of people uh, in, are here already, so I'm sure more people will join in. Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to our webinar series. My name is Chris M, Operations Director at Civil Service College. I'm facilitating today's webinar. Civil Service College webinars aim to connect public sector colleagues in the UK and abroad with our expert trainers. Our webinars look at topical issues and its application with real life examples. If today is your first time joining our webinar series, you are very welcome and I hope you will like it. For our alumni, welcome back. Let me start off with a very brief introduction to Civil Service College. We are an independent training organization that's offer training solutions to the UK civil service and the wider public sector. As you can see from this slide, we have delivered trainings to not just the central government departments like Cabinet Office, DEFRA, EWP, but also to devolve administrations like the Welsh Government and of course our National Health Service as well as local authorities. On the right hand side, you can see our footprint in the UK. We have also worked with governments across the world. We had delegates from many locations from the Far East to Africa um, and Bill of course have met uh, many delegations from different countries and he delivered training to them. Um, and I think in today's webinar, we do have some attendees from abroad as well. Uh, welcome. We conduct over 70 different types of courses across seven key categories, ranging from accountability and governance to finance and commercial skills. And today we'll be talking about better business cases that is under the finance and commercial series. Um, Bill actually also specializes in the accountability and governance courses, uh, where he's the lead trainer to deliver uh, most of the courses in that category. So if you would like to know more about that, you can visit our website um, and see the type of courses that he offer as well. Alternatively, just get in touch with us and then we can uh, give you more further information. You can join one of our open courses, uh, attending um, with other colleagues from different public bodies, uh, or you can ask us to tailor the training specifically for you and your team. And this way the training materials reflects the environments you worked in. For our international audience, uh, we can deliver the trainings to you virtually or fly out to your country when travel permits. We are based in the heart of Westminster, right next to St. James's Park, opposite the Ministry of Justice, Parliament is roughly 10 minutes walk from our office and Supreme Court is five minutes away. Please do visit us once the lockdown is really over. Um, and I think at the current race, we'll be really looking at uh, the winter time or even early 2021. But hopefully we will get to see everyone in the near future. Um, allow me to do a few more housekeeping notes before we start. Today's webinar is being recorded. We will email you uh, this video in a day or two. For your colleagues who are unable to join us today, please feel free to share the recording with them later on. And do subscribe to our YouTube channel so you don't miss out on any of our webinars and other learning videos. Another housekeeping note, if you have a question for us, whether it is on tech issues or regarding this subject, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we will try to keep this webinar as interactive as possible. So please do share your thoughts in the chat box. And if you're happy to share with everyone, please have your message sent to all panelists and attendees. Otherwise, only Bill and I will be able to see your message. And if it's tech related, I will try to answer uh, throughout the presentation so you get the message straight away. If it's something that only Bill can answer, I will either interrupt him or I will wait until the Q&A section towards the end. So today's our title is Developing Better Business Cases in the Coronavirus World. We're very pleased to have our expert trainer, Bill Malloy, with us. Bill has extensive experience working in the public sector. Over the last 15 years, he has covered social care, education, police, and national security. He has worked with social services inspectorate, Ofsted, Care Quality Commission, Her Majesty Inspectorate of Constabulary and the National Audit Office, including briefings for the Intelligence and Security Committee, and have appeared 
at the Public Accounts Committee to give evidence on the value for money audits carried out by the NAO into the expenditure of a mo mobile technology in policing grants. He brings practical knowledge and applications of governance and accountability across different tiers of government and public sector bodies. In addition to that, Bill is a qualified public sector accountant and obtained qualifications in export management with the Institute of Export, Bright MBA, Prince2, ITIL, HM Treasury, Better Business Cases. Bill, I know you we've been just now coming out from the lockdown. During the lockdown, did you obtain any more qualifications that I have missed? Um, the only qualifications I've got now are in childcare, I think. Um, <laughs> uh, having some children at home with me during lockdown. Um, all driving me crazy, but um, crazy. Well, there we go. We're, all, we're all in the same boat now. Yes. So, Bill, now now is over to you. Can you tell us more about developing better business cases? Right. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, let me just get my presentation up and running for everyone. Um, hopefully, everybody can see this now. Um, so, we'll start sharing this. Right, developing business cases in a post-coronavirus world. So what we want to try and do today, if I can get the slides to move on, <clears throat> is first of all, have a look at where we are with respect to coronavirus or COVID. Um, see what the likelihood is of the impact in a post-coronavirus world. Um, obviously, we're focusing here on the UK. Um, we'll talk about the importance of business cases in general. And then what we'll do is we'll go on to um, review the five case model that we have in the UK. Um, and we'll talk about how we develop business cases using this model. So the impact of uh, coronavirus. So obviously there's gonna be an ongoing impact on health and public services. Um, the, the amount of money we're pouring into Healthcare at the moment and social care at the moment is uh, quite phenomenal, um, and also respect with uh, respect to other public services. When you think about um, people being on furlough and the government contributing towards uh, the payment of of uh, wages while people are on furlough, it's quite a huge, huge financial burden. Um, so the welfare state really is um, being hammered at the moment, and of course. Um, we've all got coping strategies at the moment. So things like, like we're doing now on the webinar um, and a lot of government departments, a lot of public sector bodies and a lot of private bodies um, are all actually working from home. So you're seeing a, a huge increase in people working from home. And will that, um, will that follow once we go out of lockdown? Will that follow when things return to what I would say is a new normal. I think it. I think it will. I think we're going to we're going to see some significant changes in the way that we work, uh, the way we do our day in day out kind of uh, levels of work. Um, and what about election promises? Because last year in the uh, in the election in November, uh, the Conservative Party made quite a lot of promises, and from what we've seen recently, they still intend to fulfil as many as those promises as possible. Uh, now, the reality might just dawn that perhaps uh, the amount of money we have in the kitty may not be enough, uh, or perhaps priorities will change in a post-COVID world. Uh, but certainly at this point in time, the, those election promises are still valid. Um, and we've already talked about the impact on the public purse. Um, and when we think about the public purse in general, in the UK, we spend around about between 750 and 800 billion on public sector services. So that's a lot of money to spend. So will we see cutbacks going forward? The Chancellor yesterday announced a comprehensive spending review. So will we see um, a cutback in services? Will we see a cutback in budgets? Will we see additional taxes? We don't know yet. It all has a huge impact on the public purse. And I'll put a question there about the age of the pandemic. Are we now in a new age? Are we now in a new environment where perhaps on a regular basis or a more regular basis, we are gonna see the emergence perhaps of another pandemic or perhaps a, a, a much lower level of pandemic going forward? Um, certainly indicators are at the moment that going into winter, governments around the world uh, are certainly 
worried about potentially a new strain of COVID or mm. perhaps a second wave coming in. And that can have a huge consequence on the public purse. So at the moment, I mean, it's still very early in the crisis, but the statistics that are coming out at this point in time, according to the OBR, are that the, the, the public sector is going to be hit with a £300 billion pound bill. Um, that's a huge, huge amount of money for us to try and recoup. And it's against this kind of um, bill for, for this and, and the sort of potential cutbacks that we need to start thinking about our business cases. How do we actually justify expenditure on some of the things that we, we want to try and do? When you look back to the 2008 financial crisis, there was a huge impact. Um, the cash cost to the Treasury at that point in time was 124 billion. So the 300 billion that we're currently estimate, that sort of puts it into perspective. Now, although we bailed the banks out in the UK, and I think the initial cost was about 850 billion, um, obviously that went into shares and it wasn't cash injection, it was just bailing out. Just bailing out. There's an understatement. Um, so the 124 billion cash cost by 2011 sort of puts what we're doing now into real perspective. It makes it real. It lets us know that when we're thinking about spending money uh, on any new policy or um, any new capital or whatever, that we've really, really got to examine it and justify it. So why is the business case so important? Um, well, the five case model that we've got in the UK gives us a framework um, and it's a good framework. It's a framework for actually scoping our proposals. It's a framework for planning our spending as well. The other thing about this is it gives us the approval routes. You know, it gives us that internal and that external point of approval so that we know that what we're doing has a thumbs up and that we're just not going ahead on our own. It's about accountability for public funds. How, how can we be made accountable for our expenditure? Well, the way that we are made accountable is to complete a business case and get it signed off with the proper scrutiny. It's recognized best practice. This works, five case model works, and, and it works throughout the world, uh, not just in the UK. And it's recognized as best practice. Um, the other element here, and those of you that have done any project management before, anyone who's done anything like prints will actually understand that the repository that you have for your decisions that you that you make, the evidence that you have, those audit trails that you have are really important. And it also gives you a basis for carrying out a post implementation evaluation. OK, so at the end of it, you can compare. You've got that baseline. You can have a look back and you can say, right, did we do this properly? Did it work out the way that we thought and learn those lessons? Um, However, this is, the, this is the reality, isn't it? The reality is um, that quite often, certainly in the past, um, a lot of new spend is unsupported. Uh, there, there are inadequate business cases. It's very difficult to actually see what people wanted to do. And it's very difficult to pin down who it was that signed it off, who authorized this expenditure. So, and quite often we get business cases and they are, you know, full of optimism bias, uh, and I've put their suboptimal value for money. You know, we're actually not going to produce what we want to produce through this sort of business case. Um, we often get an expensive use of consultancy, so we'll get a lot of consultants in. I'm not going to anything against consultants, but in a manageable way, and they will come in, and a lot of money will be spent on them. They won't have the right direction. There'll be poor business cases telling them or asking them what to do. Um, and you end up with a suboptimal um, delivery. And of course, we have no sort of standard or methodology, or we do have a standard or, or methodology, but we just don't use it. So quite often in a public sector, things will be done on the back of a spreadsheet. Um, so we've got to really clamp down on that and, and sort of start using uh, best practice, really. Now, this sort of tools that we, we use here, this five case model, um, the evidence is there from New Zealand, from Australia, uh, and even in the private sector, the World Bank used this. 
Um, so as well as our, our government using it, it's used in those sort of those areas. So we know fine well that it works. The Standish report um, is, is a useful little tool for having a look at project status. And this is a bit of a reality check for us. Overall project success rate is only 28%. So less than a third of projects actually deliver what they're supposed to. The average cost overrun is 45%. The average time overrun is 63%. So most projects actually overrun on time. And then you've got the shortfall in requirements of 33%. So about a third of all projects actually fail uh, the sort of quality test and delivery. And we can see this in our own public sector delivery. When we have a little look at some of these examples, you've got there the Channel Tunnel, cost overrun by 5.2 billion pounds. Uh, the Millennium Dome, they overestimated the number of visitors there by five and a half million. Jubilee Line extension cost overrun 1.4 billion and a late delivery of two years. And the Scottish Parliament went 10 times over its budget and was also delivered late. Um, and we've got question marks over high speed two as well in the UK. So high speed two, original budget was about 30 billion, latest figures that we've all seen are over 100 billion. Um, where will it go really? Uh, and where will it go in terms of um, its, its final cost? That's what I mean, not in terms of where will the railway go? Um, so you can see there what we're up against. And another sort of good example I wanna pull out here um is the fire control project so project here to set up nine regional control centers for fire and rescue services in england and um the business case went through they started building these fire control centers nice shiny new buildings nice new it um set up computers and everything in there but just before they actually launched them and started going what they actually realized was that there were commercial clauses in there that meant that as soon as they start using these buildings the costs would escalate so um, that in the end although we had nice shiny new buildings the decision was made not to start using them okay so this went to the public accounts committee in in our parliament and what they then um, summarized was in the bottom right hand corner uh, the project was not resilient and there was insufficient scrutiny of costs and contracts. Now that was something that happened because of a poor business case that went through. And you can see in the top right that the empty buildings in the end ended up costing the taxpayer four million pound a month to maintain. Uh, that is certainly suboptimal value for money. I want to show you a video. Uh, this is uh, the Public Accounts Committee. And um, this is uh, an example of disclosure and barring service where uh, they inherited a business case from the Home Office. And the business case was listed out a, a number of benefits that would be delivered. And what you're about to hear is you're about to hear the Home Office being asked about the benefits that were delivered or were they delivered. Um, and then at the end of, of this video, what I'll do is I'll just sort of make a couple of uh, learning points and highlights. Okay, great. If you could just uh, give me one word answers, yes or no, to these lists, this list about whether they've been achieved or not. Financial savings of up to £37 million per annum. No. Uh, overall contract cost reduced by 15 to 20% over the lifetime of the five-year contract that was let. Uh, no. Okay. Introduction of electronic applications in full for all areas. Uh, not in, not for all areas. No. Introduction of electronic referrals in full for all areas. No. I Improved matching algorithms that helps automation. No. I suspect you're going to read me a long list. I of am areas indeed. So if you just bear with me, I'll finish. I'll finish. Uh, innovative use of social media and other ICT to improve the customer experience through the issuing of electronic certificates. Uh, I think some of that has been delivered. Uh, which electronic certificates are now being dealt with? Because I understand the NA report suggests that's not the case. In um, uh, the basic certificate that we have introduced in September. He's offered has... it electronically? Yes. Okay, excellent. But for the remainder it isn't? Because so we have, hasn't been within done. the Enhanced Disclosure Service, 
85% uh, of applications are received electronically through our registered bodies. Uh, what the modernisation programme will do is to deliver that for the full um, population. But it's not been delivered for, for the full population? No, yet. that's still under discussion. Right. And the final one, reduce costs for customers? No, that hasn't been delivered. Okay, in fact, quite the contrary. The costs are more and more expensive than was expected. It was originally expected to be £10, it's £13 for the update service, correct? That's correct. Great. Um, and then can we run through that list again in terms of whether you expect them to be realised by the end of the contract? So £37 million in annualised financial savings? So... Um, a yes or no answer? It's not always easy to give a yes know, or no that's, answer. That's, that's, that, that's why you're the chief executive, so uh, yes or no. <laughs> so, so that's why you're the chief executive. There's a nice comment at the end of that, isn't it? Um, the, the point of showing this is that obviously all of these uh, benefits were part of the business case. And if you get the assumptions wrong, if you don't do the right analysis, if the business case doesn't add up, then potentially you'll be scrutinized in the way that um, this business case has been scrutinized. And um, you don't particularly want to end up in front of the Public Accounts Committee in the House of Commons uh, with this sort of level of scrutiny. So, the Cabinet Office did a study of project failure, and when they had a little look, um, there were uh, a number of reasons. There were eight sort of most common reasons. So you've got the sort of top four here. The first of all, lack of strategic fit. So no clear link to the organisation's uh, priorities. Second one was um, a lack of clear senior management ownership and leadership. And it's not surprising, therefore, that if you've got a lack of strategic fit, then you've got a lack of senior management ownership as well. The two are highly interrelated. <coughs> the lack of effective engagement with stakeholders, so getting them involved. Lack of skills and proven approach to project and risk management. Uh, and bear all of these in mind when we start looking at the five cases. Um, the project not broken down into manageable steps. So trying to manage too much at once, basically, not breaking it down. So not using work breakdown structures and all of those sort of typical management strategies. The evaluation of proposals uh, linked to short term affordability. So not the longer term value for money. So not the economic case, but more about the here and the now. Uh, I've put NPV needs to be applied. NPV is the net present value. So that's where you start using discounting so that you actually understand what the current value is of future money. Yeah, we'll explain that in a little bit, uh, a little bit later. Uh, lack of understanding and contact with suppliers. Can suppliers actually work this project? Can they do this? Are we managing our suppliers? And a lack of effective integration between the client, supplier and the supplier chains. Have we got this right from end to end? And these are the, the sort of key eight reasons why projects tend to fail. So the Better Business Cases um, product is, um, I've, I've put it up here for you. There's a guide to developing the project business case. There's also a guide to developing the program business case. Um, and those both, both of those um, guidance notes are issued by the Treasury and Welsh Government. And they align with uh, HMT's Green Book. And the Green Book for many years has been the Bible in the public sector of actually how to appraise and evaluate anything that we want to do in terms of uh, policy or in terms of projects. It was developed jointly originally by the Welsh Government and New Zealand Government. Um, and of course HMT have now adopted it because it seems to work quite well. So this is our preferred model in the UK. The five case model, we're actually trying to, to answer these key questions. So first of all, is there a compelling case for the change? So have we lined the ducks up? Do we really need this change or not? Does the recommended option optimise public value? So are we maximising value for money in our choice of which option we want to take? 
is the potential deal achievable and attractive to the marketplace? This is all about our commercial solution. Can we actually go to market with this? Um, is there anyone in market who, um, who can actually do this? Or do we need to create the interest in the market for someone actually to take this on? Um, is the spending proposal affordable? Now, do we have the budget? If we've not got the budget, where are we gonna get the money from? And that reminds me, looking at that, I need to change that dollar sign to a pound sign. Um, how will the proposal be delivered successfully? So can we deliver it? Um, a lot of organizations take on projects and actually they can't do them. Um, they've not got the right staff in place. They've not got enough staff that they can free up. They've just not got the bandwidth to do any of this. So therefore we have these, what they call five cases or five dimensions. Um, the first one is the strategic case, and we'll go around clockwise, then the economic case, then the commercial case, the financial case, and the management case. Those cases together make up our business case. And you can see here how we map those questions on to the, each of those cases, each one aligning with each of the five different cases in the five case model. So let's talk about the strategic case first. So we're talking about the strategic fit. Um, this is the bit where you, you use the golden thread from what your organization is trying to do, what your organization is trying to achieve, and what you are trying to propose. Does it actually fit with what your organization does? And does it fit with public sector policy? So not just your organization, but the public sector in general. Um, and the other thing here is you need to establish a robust case for change. So why is it that we want to do this change? And it's not just the strategic fit, it's making this strategic case. This is why we want to change. Um, and these, these are the sort of things we look for in a strategic case. First of all, the spending objectives. You know, what is it that we're, we're trying to get out of this investment? Um, I've put SMART up there, um, specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time bound. All of those things need to be thought about when we're um, listing out our spending objectives. Also in the strategic case, where are we now? What are the existing arrangements? What, what baseline are we coming from um, that, that makes us want to change? So the business needs will emerge from that, what the problems are that we are facing, uh, and potentially what are the opportunities there for to actually overcome some of those problems. The potential scope. So what are the solutions? How do we work up our solutions? And there is a way of actually working those up contained in the guidance that you can work through. You know, what are our options? And the combination of options will give us our optimal solution. The main benefits. Now we put here criteria by stakeholder group. Now not all stakeholders will benefit, we know that, but there will be key stakeholders that we need to engage and we need to align. And the key risks. What I would say here is categorize your risks, make sure you've got those categories of risks so that you recognize it and you know what risks you're going to be managing. And of course, our constraints, um, finance, time, quality, standard type constraints for any business case or for any project or program. Moving on now to the economic case. So the economic case is about what choice we are making. So from our range of options, we've got a large range of options and we narrow that down and eventually we get a short list and a preferred option. We do that within the economic case. And in doing so, what we come out with is that the preferred option optimizes value for money. So we've made the strategic case and in the economic case, we work that up and it becomes real. We talk about the costs, we talk about the benefits we also talk about the dis-benefits, because if we have any dis-benefits associated with the program, we need to highlight those. We need to understand how they relate to the stakeholders and how we're gonna minimize that impact of those dis-benefits. This will include you know, these points I've got on the screen now, the economic appraisal of a policy program or project. So we've got the options analysis, like I said, we've got the long to short list using an options framework. And there is a specific 
options framework in the five case model that we, we use to analyze those options. It's not a case of the options are this, 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 and this, let's go and analyze them. It's wider than that and it's narrowing it down. It's what is the scope and then narrow that scope down so that you get a product that you know you can implement and use. You look at the costs and benefits to society. That's an important word here, society, because this is about the wider society. What are the benefits? What is the value for money to UK PLC as a whole? Or if you're in a different country from the UK, what are the benefits to your country as a whole, your government as a whole, not just your narrow, um, the narrowness of your own organisation? Um, the other thing there is about the, the sort of cost and benefit analysis against a range of shortlisted options. Uh, it's only by doing a proper cost benefit analysis that you'll be able to identify uh, the greatest value for money options. Optimism bias and identification and costing of risks. Now, quite often you can't actually cost up a risk but quite often you can. And it's important that if you can cost up a risk, so if, we, if there's a risk of something happening and you have to offset that by another action to minimize or mitigate that risk, then that will have a cost. You need to include that. You need to include that in your costings. Optimism bias. The Treasury produced guidance for optimism bias. There are specific rates according to the type of project you're doing, whether it's a building project or an IT project, and you can use those rates to actually include a percentage for optimism bias in, in your workings. Um, the analysis of distribution effects. So who are the winners and losers? Um, it, they may not necessarily be um, direct stakeholders, but you will quite often have losers in anything that you want to do. So policies tend to have losers in them. So you might be benefiting 90% of society, but 10% of society might end up losing as a result. And you need to be able to balance those against each other. This is the options framework. This is how you sort of narrow down your options. We talk about the scope, you know, the coverage of the service. We talk about how it could be done, who can do it, what form it can be implemented in, and of course the funding. How is it going to be paid for? Is it going to be the public sector that's going to pay for it, or is it going to be private sector, or is it going to be a combination? By using those different options choices, you can narrow down and end up with a best value for money solution that maximizes the benefits The commercial case. What we need to do with the commercial case is we need to actually show that we can procure this product, that whatever we're trying to do, whatever the business case is about, actually, do you know what? We can go out to tender and there is space in the market and there are suppliers and there are people out there that will help us for this. Um, and of course, the deal has to be on an efficient market basis. So it's not just anybody can put any kind of bid in, we actually need to understand that there is a competitive market out there and that when we go out, we go out to tender and we get a number of comparators in and rather than as just sort of going to one supplier, we use all the different processes and all the different commercial tools that, that we can do. The next point on there is about the potential deal and the contractual arrangements. You know, we need to make sure that we've got good contracts in place, that our contract management is going to work, that we're fully capable of managing the contract rather than the contract managing us, that we've got those points in there, you know, those break clauses that are in there where we can review stuff. These are the sorts of things that we are we're trying to do, um, and I've put, put down there in yellow at the bottom of the slide, turning the preferred option into a workable deal. That's what we're trying to achieve. And you can see there that it depends on our procurement strategy that we're gonna use, our charging payment mechanism. Um, we're trying to, to a degree, transfer risks at different phases. Um, and of course, we've got other elements in there as well, supplier implementation timescales, 
because suppliers don't necessarily have the people in place to suddenly turn stuff on. So we need to work quite closely with our suppliers for the commercial case to work. <coughs> the financial case is about affordability and funding. What is our budget? How much money do we have at our disposal? If we don't have any money at our disposal, where are we going to get it from? Do we to put a bit into treasury for extra money, for extra funding? Do we try and spin something out into the commercial market um, to try and get private sector funding, you know, the likes of PFIs and things like that, that, that we use sometimes? These are the sorts of things that we would expect to see in our financial case. We'd expect to see things like cash flows and financial statements on, on all parts of what we're trying to do so that we actually know what the flow is. When is the money gonna, gonna have to be available? At what point do we pay whom? Um, we need to see that. We need to understand what the impact is gonna be on the balance sheet. So if we're creating an asset, it's gonna be this. Um, so we need to understand all of those elements in the financial case. Um, sometimes we, it's very difficult um, to understand the difference between the economic case and the financial case at times. So I've listed out here what that is really. The focus of the economic case is about the value for money bit. The, using the net present value to actually understand that you are delivering value for money for UK PLC and not necessarily for the organisation. The standards you use in the economic case are based on the green book, whereas the standards you use on the financial case are about financial regulations and standing orders and so on, uh, the international financial standards. Okay, it's about accountability and funding. The management case is about the actual delivery. Can we deliver this? Do we have the structures in place? What structures are we going to put into place to make sure that we can deliver this? What resources have we got? Do we have any project managers? Have we got the people that can ha actually handle this? Or will we have to get people in? Will we have to go out and get an implementation partner? Who knows? So how are we going to plan for it as well? You know, if we're, we're going into a project, are we going to use, you know, agile methodology? Are we going to use um, waterfall methodology? What kind of systems, what kind of processes are we going to use to actually manage this? And how are we going to report this back up um, through our own chain so that we've got oversight at the senior level as well? We need to think about all of these things. And if we've not got them in place, how are we going to get them in? And these are the sorts of things that, you, you know, we would expect to see in a management case. Use of special advisors, perhaps. Um, benefits realisation. I've put that in there almost as a bit of a tip for the benefits register, because if you've got a large, complex project, you will need a benefits manager in place with a um, a benefits plan in place to actually realize those benefits, you know, some of those early wins, some of those longer term wins. And of course, you've got your assurance arrangements that we've, we've talked about. Um, are you going to use gateway reviews? Well, if it's a large project, you should use gateway reviews. Um, post implementation review is another one. We're very, very poor at doing post implementation reviews in the public sector. Um, we quite often will pat ourselves on the back when we've actually delivered something and we'll say well done we've delivered it and I've, I've got experience of this myself um, from some of my days in the MOD where we've delivered stuff everybody sits around and we all sort of clap clap and cheer and all of that and then um, probably because I was on the finance side and, and uh, sort of doom and gloom sort of person um, I would challenge whether we've delivered it on budget have we delivered it on time and what about the scope have we delivered the full scope and when people say no to all three of those questions, I say, well, it wasn't really a successful project. Um, needless to say, I was not very popular when I sort of came out with those kind of questions, but there you go. Um, so we need to do those post implementation reviews so that we learn the lessons so that we do it better next time so that we can plan better. And contingency plans. What happens when things go off the rail? You know, how are we going to bring them back in? That's not necessarily about change management and having a change strategy within your projects or within your business case, but it's a case of what happens when things go extremely wrong. Is there a plan B? So let's talk a bit about um, the types of business cases that we have. So 
there's there's three key key elements here. The first one is strategic outline program case, the SOP as it's called, and this is for um, this will be be done right at the beginning when you've got a number of projects that you might need to manage to achieve an outcome, and you do one of these um, a SOP. Um, You've then got the sort of standard business case uh, with its three stages where you do a strategic outline case, then an outline business case, and then the full business case. And then if you've got something smaller going on, so it may be a, you know, a smaller amount of money, but you still actually need to get something signed off. It's what, what we know here is the business justification case, a BJC. Uh, and that might only be a couple of sides of A4, just evidencing that you've thought about all the main issues, you've thought about those five business case elements, and that you've got it all covered off. So if you've got a major sort of business case going through, and this is how you'll do it, obviously the SOC, the OBC, and the FBC, and you'll push all of those through, and each one of those will build on the previous one. So in the SOC, the strategic outline case, you would concentrate quite largely on the strategic context. So creating that sort of case for change. You try and identify a sort of preferred way forward. You've not fully developed the business case at this point. So it's not fully developed in all of these cases, but you've cracked on and there are some elements of some of those cases in there. You are trying to give an indicator of a preferred way forward. And like I say, it's only an indicator at this point. And you're talking about probable cost benefits and risks. And when you think about something like High Speed 2, um, hugely complex project, how on earth, strategic outline case, will you know exactly how much it will cost? You won't. So that's why you will give an indicator of what you think at that point it will cost. Um, and with a lot of our sort of public sector um cases you'll be in exactly exactly the same position it will be a highly complex business case it will be a highly complex thing that you're trying to build and you will not know for certain how much you're going to need until you get down into that detail the outline business case will revisit that and um will then identify the option that optimizes the the best value for money the outline business case, I have to say, is where most of the work will go in. OK, so this is the real chunky piece of work that you will have to do, um, because this will need to be done to a great to, um, level of depth. So you will need to really understand all of your options. You'll need to do the cost benefit analysis. You'll need to have done your net present value on your economic, your economic case. You will have to have lined up what your procurement is going to be like. So all of those elements will have to be in there. So you're more or less there at the end of your outline business case. And then your full business case is that final piece, just that final bit of the jigsaw to get you over the hurdle. So you've already done a lot of your sort of um, commercial stuff. You've gone out and this is actually about, um, from a commercial perspective, what's called the BAFO, the best and final offer. And this actually confirms what you want to do. You're just now looking for a decision to say, yes, let's do it. And that's what your FBC is about. And like I say, most of the work will be done in your OBC. Now, pull this back up because what we've got here is you've now got the different stages and what you're trying to do with each of these. So your SOC, you've got your case for changes established, preferred way forward identified, and the decision point at the end of that is to undertake the thorough appraisal of the shortlist. Okay, we've got the shortlist, we've identified this, this is what we think it's going to be. Then your OBC, you put that heavy work in, you identify what the option is, you line up all of the deals, and you need that decision to go ahead with procurement. Are we going to go ahead with this or not? Yes, we are. And then at the end of your FBC, you've got the decision to award the contract. OK, you've identified who um, the, the key suppliers are going to be and you line all your ducks up at that point for a big thumbs up. Hopefully it will be a thumbs up if you've done it properly. This, um, I've, I've extracted this from the, the Treasury guidance. This is what they, how they see it sort of unfolding. 
So strategic outline case, you've got elements of each of the five. You'll notice there that your commercial case is only about 20%. Your management case is very low on there as well um, because you're not too worried about that. You're, what you're trying to do is actually make the case for change at that point. But your strategic case is almost 50% complete. So you're, you're really building it up. Then at OBC, you can see the changes that get made there. Your commercial case develops significantly um, at OBC. All of your cases are starting to really come on. And then you've just got the final bit for your FBC. Um, and that's, it's an interesting sort of diagram. I mean, I tend to find that actually at OBC, some of these columns should perhaps be a bit higher um, around about the 80% kind of mark so that all you're doing then by FBC is just finishing it off, just polishing it up. Um, business justification case. So like I was saying, you don't want to do war and peace for a small investment. You may be that you've got a quick project that you want to spin up to get something done. It's going to cost you 50,000 or 100,000, maybe it depends on your organization, the size of your organization and the budget. But you'll spin this up, business justification case. It's not war and peace. It's relatively straightforward. You can create a very flexible um, framework to do this. It's one, one document. It's not OBCs and FBCs and everything. And you go through your five cases and you just justify in there. So it's maybe two or three, depending upon the project, maybe four um, sides of A4, just saying what you want to do, the costs involved and so on. And you need to get that thumbs up. This allows you to have, first of all, it allows you to do your planning and, and your, your sort of thoughts on these and identify your risks and so on. But the other element of this is it allows you to give something to the decision makers in the organization who can sign it off. This is your audit trail. This will look after your back and protect you. Um, so you can get this signed off, you can shove it through and then just crack on with it. You know, it doesn't have to be a big bureaucratic sort of nightmare like your FBCs might, might have to go through, okay? So this is a, a really good one to introduce into your organizations. Okay, so just in summary, um, because we're heading towards 20 past 11 now. What we've, what we've done is we've quickly been through the sort of basis for the business cases. You've seen sort of some of the reasons, some of the failures that we've had previously. You've seen um, our public accounts committee in action. Um, and so what you've then got here, what we've presented here today, is the sort of best practice framework, the five case model and the business case development. The five case model being, strategic, economic, commercial, financial, and management. Okay, the slides that we've shown today will show you the difference between the economic case and the financial case. And it also has contained some of the detail that you will need in each of those five cases. Um, obviously, you would need to look at uh, the detail that is required a lot more or potentially, you know, if for example, through one of the courses that we run here, you may sort of go on those courses and you will learn a lot more about how to narrow them down and how to build that business case a bit better. We've been through the business case development, very high level, SOC, OBC, FBC, and of course the BJC. So with that summary behind you, I think what we'll do now is I'll pass over to Chris and yeah. see if we've got any further questions on this. Yep, thank you very much. So we can open up the floor for questions. Um, in fact, there's one question. Um, out of the five uh, cases, uh, which case do people often find more, most difficult? Or where you can often find that they don't have the right evidence or have the optimism bias? Okay, so the biggest case in there is the economic case. Because the economic case, um, is the one where you're trying to evidence value for money for the economy as a whole, so for the government as a whole. Um, it's also the case where you will start off with um, a framework, for, and, and then that fr that's the options framework I'm talking about. And you're trying to actually understand how many options you have. Now that can be 
a dozen options or maybe even 15 options, depending upon what you're trying to do. Trying to narrow that down in a planned and progressive way is a bit of a nightmare. Mm. Uh, trying to actually attach um, finances and monetary values to some of the benefits and disbenefits can be difficult as well. Mm. And this is the case where it all goes in. So that's the case where it's very easy to trip up and it's very easy to make a mistake. And you shouldn't go into this with any sort of predetermined sort of solution in mind. We shouldn't mm. be going into this and saying the solution is this or that. It's a case of building it all up. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I think no one would actually uh, foreseen how public finance have changed over the pandemic. And in a way, I think all the business cases that made before the pandemic could not have kind of foreseen the situation that we are in now. No. But does this mean that there is really no way to future proof your business case? Because evidence do change. Yeah, I mean, the, the thing is, I mean, when you're doing, doing your strategic case, for example, a, a good way of doing a strategic case is when you do your sort of your external view of the world, um, you do like a pestle analysis, okay? Um, so you do a, when I say pestle, it's uh, political, economic, social, technical, um, um, legal, and environmental, okay? Mm -hmm. That gives you your pestle. Uh, with an LE on the end or an EL, yes. whatever word you want. Okay, but that gives you the main elements that you should really do your sort of horizon scanning on. Now, I think six months ago, well, not six months ago, a year ago, would anyone have seen COVID coming down the line? No. I mean, when was the last huge pandemic that we had across the world? The last huge one was probably 100 years ago. Yes. You know, the blue pandemic at the end of World War One. So the likelihood of there being another pandemic was very low. But now, of course, that's high on the radar, and we know that that's high on the radar. And we may want to think of, rather than thinking of specifically a pandemic, we can think of things like um, worldwide events. You know, it's like the economic crash in 2008, uh, the financial mm -hmm. crash in 2008. You know, we didn't see that coming. And on a regular basis, there is a cycle of things that upset the world, the world economy. So there are times that we're going to go through highs and lows of our own internal economies in whichever country we live in going high and low, peaks and troughs. We need to be able to actually understand that those can come in. So these are the sort of things that we need to be able to understand if we're doing a very large business case mm. in our strategic case. Thank you. Um, what, what happens when analysts aren't able to do NPV or CBA for the economic case due to the lack of evidence um, at OBC or FBC stage? Okay, so what you should always line up in, in any business case is your assumptions. And um, if you then need to make assumptions because analysts aren't able to or because there isn't enough or sufficient evidence then what you need to do is, is go, go back to basics and actually make an assumption yourselves, okay? Um, and there's no reason why you can't run your assumptions past someone else, you know, and, and ask them, do you think this is a valid assumption? Um, or you can put a, a risk sort of basis alongside it, you know, a margin for error alongside your, some of your assumptions. So you can say, well, my assumption is this. However, if there is a 20% margin either way, it could be this or it could be this. Thank you, Bill. Um, I mean, of course, you have highlighted some of the uh, cases where projects have overrun and not really showing value for money. Um, at the beginning of the presentation, you did say the project success rate is 28%. Now, um, Sue, I've asked actually, um, what are the projects that did meet delivered on time um, the, within the cost and within the scope as well? Like, I think I think it'd be useful to know kind of um, what what are the success, successful cases out there. Okay, well, there's a there's a couple of successful IT cases um, in in the mix. Um, when you have a little look at driver uh, and vehicle licensing agency, for example, some of the projects that they they worked on, the DVLA have worked on have delivered really well, very well, in fact. Um, so some of those sort of agencies have done, have, have done that. 
Um, the other thing as well is when you have a look at some of the sort of building contracts that we've done for, for roads and bypasses and stuff like that, once we've actually spun them up and started, some of those have been really well delivered um, because we've got the experience of doing it, we've got the knowledge of doing it, we've got the history of doing it, and we know what those phases are. So those work breakdowns are already there. So quite often, this is about actually learning from other projects. So look at other projects that mm. have done well, or even look at other projects that haven't done well and learn those lessons. So something that will give you a baseline that you can actually manage your own sort of business case and your own project against. Yeah, I think that's what Stu is trying to get at, is uh, how can, uh, if, if you want to know about a good business case, can they approach them, who, like, who, knowing who did a really good business case, you can learn from them. Yeah. And is there actually anywhere that these business cases would be kind of um, be available for other public sector colleagues to see, to see in a, like good examples that like share on maybe like a public domain that's available for other public sector colleagues to see? Yeah. Yeah, so there are some good examples. Um, if you have a little look at the NAO's website, quite often the NAO will produce good examples and good case studies. Um, Cabinet Office often do that as well. So I think in the green book, actually, at the back of the green book, there is a reference list that has um, a number of projects indicated. And throughout the green book, they will talk about best practice. So if you look up best practice, um, for projects in the public sector, you'll probably get direct to Green Book and NAO as well, because they have a, a, a list of things that have worked really quite well. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Bill. Um, I apologise to those who have submitted your questions. Um, unfortunately, we are running out of time, so I need to bring this webinar to a close. But thank you very much for all your questions. Um, and do get in touch if you have any further questions. Um, uh, we were trying to answer them as we as much as we can. Um, just a few more um, information. Um, as kind of during this pandemic, we have really scaled up delivering our training virtually. We have recently launched a new offer uh, to encourage people to sign up for virtual learning rather than wait until face-to-face -face training becomes available. So now all our virtual training is at 395. Whereas before, it's at 595, so the savings of 33%. And of course, if you buy in a package, um, it's, you get further savings. So please do get in touch if you want to take advantage of this package. This applies to any courses that are being delivered virtually. Um, so please do get in touch. Uh, we can let you know a bit more. Um, do sign up to our webinars um, through our website, www.civilservicecollege.org.uk. Um, in today's webinar, we talk about a lot of um, um, requirements to know some of the financial terms, having that financial uh, commercial awareness. So next week, we'll be running a webinar on financial and commercial awareness. So if you go back to the page where you have signed up for this webinar, you will see further details about next week's webinar on financial and commercial awareness. And finally, do subscribe to uh, our social media platforms. We are on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube, uh, pretty much all, all, the, all the major platforms. Um, so we would love to hear from you and do stay in touch with us. And like I said, if you have any other questions uh, for me or Bill, do write to us. Uh, me and my colleagues will be monitoring all communications platform. Um, other than that, um, thank you very much for attending and very, very, thank you very much, Bill, for delivering such an insightful uh, presentation. Um, stay safe, everyone, and stay connected. Goodbye, everyone. <laughs>